Hi, I'm Dan Barrow. I'm the Pamela R. Rollins Professor and Chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Dan Barrow, Chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at Emory University School of Medicine. He has authored over 250 scientific articles and chapters in medical textbooks. He has authored or edited 12 monographs, including a major textbook of neurosurgery, The Practice of Neurosurgery. He has been a visiting professor at major universities throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. Dr. Barrow has been active in organized neurosurgery, holding a variety of leadership and editorial positions. He was on the executive committee of the CNS and served as a scientific program chairman, annual meeting chairman, and president. He's a director of the American Board of Neurological Surgeons and currently serves as secretary of the board. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Dan Barrow, Chair of Neurosurgery at Emory. Doc, how are we doing today? Great. Thank you. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowship? Well, I think uh, to answer that, uh, I should tell a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a physician because my father was a physician, really never for a single day as a child did I desire to be anything but a physician in few days as an adult had been any different. But my father was a general practitioner in a very small rural community in Midwestern Illinois. I ended up being an academic neurosurgeon in a big city. So we might as well have been in different professions, but um, uh, we, we always had great respect for what each other did. So I was uh, attracted to neurosurgery early in medical school, not, not as a young kid, uh, attracted by the neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology, not because of a mentor that I identified that I wanted to emulate. So early in my training, I, I, I was focused on you know, being a great doctor like my dad was. My dad saw everything and took care of everything. And um, back in the day that I trained, we did a year of general surgery. So I was at Grady Hospital, which is a, a county hospital in Atlanta that uh, sees lots of trauma, lots of sick patients. And my focus was just on being able to take care of anything that came in the emergency room that I was asked to see on the wards and just really be a really, really good doctor. Um, and then as I got into neurosurgery, my focus expanded and I became uh, riveted on also learning the technical aspects of neurosurgery and as importantly, learning um, the clinical decision making to make good decisions about who needed surgery. Throughout my residency, I really always enjoyed the academic aspects, and I began publishing early and often as a, as a resident, initially on clinical topics, but then became interested in some basic science projects that, that I worked on. Um, you know, neurosurgery is a diverse field. We have many subspecialties, and I initially loved all of them and wanted to be good at all of them, but... Um, I became more and more focused on the field of microsurgery and specifically vascular neurosurgery. And so I guess that's my course. I, I wanted to be a good doctor to begin with and then gradually became more and more focused on academic vascular microsurgery. Now taking us through that fellowship year, what was your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? Well, I had a pretty unique situation uh, at Emory uh, where I trained. Uh, my chairman, George Tyndall, had made it pretty clear early in my training that there was a job for me here uh, when I finished. Um, I really knew that I uh, wanted to uh, be in an academic environment because the type of neurosurgery that I did, at least at that time, was really only being done in academic centers. I, I loved Atlanta, I loved Emory, I was single throughout my residency, so I didn't have to take into consideration a spouse and kids and all of those things. Um, so my perspective really didn't change at all. It just simply became reinforced um, as we all became more uh, subspecialized in the field of neurosurgery in the early years of my, uh, my training. And I also uh, realized uh, just how much I really enjoyed the academic environment. I think surrounding yourself with bright, young, energetic uh, individuals is a safeguard against senility. Uh, I mean, young people, um, young medical students don't let you get away with anything. And so that just reinforced my initial decision uh, to pursue an academic career. Now, throughout your career, did you ever consider going private practice? 
I, I didn't. No, I really didn't. I, um, you know, I, I probably would have enjoyed it, but, um, but having been in an academic environment and enjoying the, the dimensions that an academic career provides me, both in terms of training the next generation, uh, doing research that, that advances our field, um, I, I, I don't think I could ever go back and do private practice. I, I quite honestly, if somebody told me today, you can't do what you do anymore, I probably would become a hunting guide in Wyoming or do something completely different. Um, you know, had I gone into the private practice of neurosurgery right out of my training, I probably would have, would have, would have enjoyed it, but I would miss desperately the, the other dimensions that an academic uh, career provides me. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the top of your industry? Well, it's very kind of you to presume that I'm at the, the top of my industry. Um, I think that any success that I've had, I, I, lo- I owe largely to, to many others. I've been blessed throughout my career to have wonderful mentors. I went to a small medical school in Illinois that was designed to uh, create private practitioners in, in, in rural medicine like my father, and I was the black sheep that ended up going into neurosurgery. And very early on, I had an opportunity to work uh, with John Jane uh, Sr. at the University of Virginia, who became a a lifelong mentor of mine. Uh, George Tyndall, who was my chairman at Emory, um, uh, opened up uh, many, many doors and opportunities for me. Uh, My fellowships at the Mayo Clinic with Dave Peepgrass and Thor Sunt and later at the Barrow Neurological Institute with Robert Spetzler, all provided additional mentors for me that uh, provided incredible opportunities that I couldn't have otherwise had. Um, I think I also owe an enormous amount to my wife, Molly, who's an oral and maxillofacial surgeon who has been incredibly supportive of my commitment that needed to be made to remain engaged in organized neurosurgery, run a department as a chairman and maintain a very busy clinical schedule. And she quite honestly gave up opportunities for leadership positions in her career so that I could do it in mine. And and she devoted much of her time to uh, making sure that our kids were, uh, had straight teeth and an education and, you know, got to bed on time. So um, I I owe a lot to, to a lot of other, other people. I think one of the other lessons that's very difficult for somebody that's advancing in academic medicine is to learn when it's okay to say no. Um, Early in one's career, every thing is an opportunity. Um, And uh, when somebody asks you to do something, you just simply don't say no, because it's an opportunity to demonstrate your commitment and your work ethic. when I was asked to be on the sergeant at arms at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons meeting, I said, absolutely, I'd love to. When asked uh, to write a chapter on spinal infections, you'd say, thank you for the great opportunity. And I think there reaches a point, you reach a point in your career where you don't have to do everything that somebody asks you to do. And that's a difficult uh, point in time to uh, identify, and that's, Another area where I think mentors can be extremely helpful in giving you that guidance and saying you've reached a point in your career where you, you've checked those boxes and here's some things that you can devote your time and energy to that are going to be much, much more uh, productive than uh, maybe some of the things you have to do early in your career. So mentorship, I think, is, is absolutely critical. What advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Well, you know, the, the world is very different now than it was when I was finish, finishing my training. Complex neurosurgery uh, back when I was training was regionalized uh, almost exclusively to academic centers and private practice of neurosurgery was primarily general neurosurgery and kind of straightforward spinal neurosurgery. Today, many large private practice groups are highly subspecialized. Um, And the economics uh, have changed tremendously. Um, uh, You know, today, many uh, neurosurgeons are are employed by uh, hospitals and big uh, uh, medical uh, institutions that have consolidated some of the smaller hospitals that used to support smaller private practices. So I I think um, 
it's a very, a very different um, time today than it was. And so I think the choices are wider. I do think, though, there's still in, in our specialty of neurosurgery, the primary decision that one needs to make uh, is, do I want to be in an academic environment where I devote part of my time to training the next generation of physicians and surgeons uh, and doing research? Or do I want to devote my entire uh, effort to uh, the practice of neurosurgery? Um, whatever job one decides to pursue, I think mentorship is, is also essential here. Most neurosurgical jobs are created and, uh, and, and filled over the telephone. Uh, you know, Ralph Dacey calls me up from St. Louis and says, Dan, I need a, a tumor surgeon. Do you have somebody? I say, absolutely. I've got somebody who's fantastic, or uh, maybe not this year, but next year. Um, and uh, by the time uh, these jobs show up uh, in, in the Journal of Neurosurgery as an advertisement, oftentimes there's been a personal discussion. And so I don't consider my job as a chairman of a department to be complete until my trainees have not only completed their training, but they also have a job that will allow them to be professionally uh, and, and personally uh, uh, satisfied. Um, I think um, the other advice that I rather routinely give my colleagues and my trainees is to uh, strongly advise them not to take a job simply because it uh, pays more. That is almost always the least important factor of a job when you take things into consideration. I tell them that in the field of neurosurgery, you're gonna make a great living and you're not gonna to have to worry about finances if you use some common sense and you just work hard. And when a resident or a colleague says to me, well, you know, I can make $100,000 more at this job than that one, I say, look, you know, you're gonna be in a 50% in a tax bracket at, at a minimum. So you're gonna make, take home an extra $50,000. What are you gonna do? You're gonna buy a yacht? You're gonna buy a private jet? Of course not. That, that extra income is not gonna take you into that next echelon of wealth unless you're fortunate enough to be really good at investing. And so, so the differences in salaries among most jobs really are truly the least important aspect of that job. I think it's far more important to be with a group of people that you really want to practice with, um, that you're, you're comfortable in the city and your family's comfortable in the city. Uh, but I think it's very common for young people coming out of a residency, oftentimes with, with debt from medical school and college, to um, be distracted by a little bit more money, which doesn't really change your life that much. Now, with the world basically being virtual right now and all these annual conferences going online, what advice do you have for the graduating class regarding their networking and outreach process? Well, unfortunately, the only advice I can give is we have to deal with it. You know, I don't like it really any more than I'm sure they do. Uh, I love, um, you know, being around people. I, I love interacting with people. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, one of the primary reasons that I've loved academic neurosurgery is because I've been able to surround myself with bright, young, energetic people that keep me on my toes. And um, uh, I would miss that desperately. And I miss the personal interaction that I typically have on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, even our, our, our grand rounds, our conferences, you know, everything today is virtual, as will be uh, our interviews. And so, I don't think any of us like that, um, but uh, it, it's something we have to deal with. And I think uh, there's still an opportunity for each individual applicant to a residency training program or an applicant for a job to demonstrate their enthusiasm, to demonstrate their accomplishments um, and their, their commitment to the field, uh, even in a virtual environment. I mean, you know, I, I've never met you, but I, I in the few minutes that we've spoken, I feel like I know things about you that I, I wouldn't have known had we not had this format. So I think we just need to make the best of it. Um, I think uh, things will get, you know, we'll get through this. We've gotten through pandemics throughout the history of humankind, and we'll get through this one as well and look back on this and, 
um, you know, I think things will never be maybe the same as they were. I think we're going to always use these virtual interactions for seeing patients. I mean, I'm seeing far more patients now virtually uh, than I ever did before. Uh, sometimes it takes a crisis like this to bring on technology that allows us to expand our ability to do the things that we've routinely done for, for many, many decades. Now, there's a Cuban component to being a surgeon. And seeing all the experience you've gone through, what advice would you have given your younger self when you're in the OR and you're dealing with difficult complications and or not ideal outcomes? Well, that, that's, um, you know, one of, the, one of the aspects of neurosurgery um, that we all have to deal with. Uh, we don't treat the measles. Uh, we treat uh, generally very uh, complicated disorders and, um, and you're bound to have outcomes that are less than what you uh, hope for and pray for uh, in certain circumstances. Anybody who says they are doing neurosurgery and not having complications is either not doing it or they're lying. Um, things just don't always turn out the way that you want. And I think that the challenge is to walk that thin line between um, not falling into despair. You got to get up the next day and go back to work, but also not becoming callous to human life and human suffering. And it really is a a very thin line that you have to walk to, to be able to truly be compassionate and concerned about the patient whose outcome you're responsible for that is not what you had hoped and, and anticipated and prayed for, but yet not becoming so devastated uh, by that complication that you can't get up and go back to work and do your very best for all your other patients. Can you talk about your journey to becoming the youngest chairman? <laughs> Well, I did become a chairman at a fairly young age. Uh, some might argue I was too young uh, at the time. Um, you know, it was never my greatest aspiration in neurosurgery to become a chairman of a department. It wasn't as though I held that out as, as a goal that uh, I needed to achieve or my career would not have been fulfilled. Uh, I really became a chairman because of, like a lot of things in life, I was just in the right place at the right time, or maybe some would say the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, my former chairman, uh, George Tyndall, who was absolutely terrific, and as I mentioned, opened many doors for me, uh, was ready to step down as chairman when I was 39 years old, uh, just about to turn 40. Um, and I was, uh, at the same time, had been asked to look at a chairmanship at Northwestern, and I had previously looked at a chairmanship opportunity at the Cleveland Clinic, but I really had no interest in leaving Emory and leaving Atlanta. Um, and uh, I really uh, took the job because my partners uh, encouraged me to. I was the internal candidate. There were some fantastic external candidates, and I guess many of my partners uh, decided they'd rather have the devil they know than the devil they didn't know, and uh, strongly encouraged me to do that. And, and I really haven't had any regrets. Uh, um, you know, it, it was, it, it took me away from some of the things that I would otherwise have maybe focused attention on, but it gave me also the most incredible opportunity over the last 25 plus years now to surround myself with my very best friends. And, and I, I think that's probably uh, the greatest uh, benefit of being a, a chair of a department is uh, that I ultimately had the say-so in who we hired and who we retained. And I, I can say without any question, we have the most collegial department of neurosurgeons I'm aware of anywhere. We, we, we're, we have a large department. We're very diverse. Uh, we are all very subspecialized. We come from different backgrounds, uh, different educations, different parts of the country and the world but we are all very, very good friends. We spend time together socially as well as professionally. And that's truly one of the benefits of having been able to uh, run this department and lead it for such a long period of time. Uh, I wouldn't give up that opportunity for anything. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.